Hello and welcome back. I'm here to talk to you today about books 10 and 11 of the Aeneid. And here we finally get the Aristia of Aeneas. Yes, this is the part of the Aeneid where Aeneas starts kicking butt and acting more like the kind of epic hero we've met so far in, in books like the Odyssey and the Iliad. And you might ask yourself why it gets so graphic and so violent in these last few books of the Aeneid. And I ask myself that too as I read passage after passage about someone putting an axe through someone else's skull or eyeballs falling onto the ground. And my only thought for you is this. Um, a lot, of course, of the violence comes from Juno and the way she stirs up the passions of Aeneas's antagonists in the persons of Turnus and Amata. So they start a lot of this trouble. However, uh, there's more to it than that. If, if you're the reader, how satisfied would you feel at the end of this thing if suddenly everyone had just sat down and had a sensible talk at the end of book eight and we'd agreed that things could be worked out after all? It wouldn't make for much of an epic. So uh, let's also think about the first few lines of this poem. Um, the very first line of the Aeneid goes, I sing of arms and a man. So we've got our man, that's Aeneas, of course, uh, but our arms really come into play in these last few books of the Aeneid, and we get that. We get all the violence you want. So without further ado, let's talk a little bit about Book 10. And this is the Aristia of Aeneas and, of course, the Death Palace. Some lines we get that indicate to us just how violent this part of the poem is are actually lines that have to do with how the gods feel about all this violence. Dio vis intectus iram miserentor, inanem emborum et tantos mortalibus esse labores. Or in English, the gods inside Jove's palace take pity on both armies' pointless anger. They sorrow at the trials of mortal men. And indeed, the gods in Virgil's Aeneid seem to take more pity on what the humans do and to feel for them um, more as if they're children uh, of theirs than as if they're uh, animals they're watching fight outside which is how it can seem in the Iliad sometimes. Virgil too doesn't seem to write off these uh, these books of the poem as a place for mindless violence. He does more than that. Um, he actually finds a way to make the violence artistic just like modern cinema, right? Um, and he gives us in Book 10 uh, several incredible extended similes which showcase just how artistic Virgil's language is. And the first is uh, in Book 10 when he compares Pallas and his men to a wildfire. And that one goes something like this. Summer winds the shepherd is hoped for begin to rise, and he sees fires here and there in the woods. Suddenly the spaces between are ablaze, and when... Vulcan's battle lines is spread across the fields. The shepherd smiles as he sits and watches the reveling flames. So too are your soldiers' valor converge to your joy, Pallas. So we get this comparison of Pallas and his men to a wildfire breaking out in the summer and the shepherd watching it and delighting in the show that Vulcan has provided for him. What does this simile have to say about the character of Pallas? I guess what it has to say is that he delights in seeing things happen uh, in the action of the war. Uh, later on in this book, uh, Aeneas will be compared to Aegean, famous monster from Greek mythology. And he'll be compared to him because Aegean has 100 hands and 50 heads. And Aeneas will seem to move like him in battle. And this is an impressive comparison. Aeneas here uh, will act like... Um, something is more than human. Uh, later on in book 11, uh, Turnus will get compared to a horse. Uh, he'll get compared to a stallion that has been let free from his stall and is running wild over a plain. And lastly, uh, Erans, one of the characters we'll meet later, will get compared to a wolf uh, and a wolf who is on the hunt. And the meaning there should become obvious to us as he is stalking his prey. Another technique that our buddy Virgil uses in these books, um, 10, 11, and 12, is intertextuality. Uh, and this, again, is where the author makes his text, the one he's writing, refer to things that have come along earlier. And the death of Pallas, the death of King Evander's son, 
is a great example of this. And uh, I'm going to compare the death of Pallas to the death of Patroclus. This seems to be the clear reference uh, in older mythology for the story we're seeing here with Pallas. Um, let's talk about how each of these stack up. Um, the most obvious thing is that Aeneas' name starts with an A and so does Achilles. And Pallas' name starts with a P and so does Patroclus'. Uh, so I, I don't think this is any kind of accident. Well, at first, these two, this comparison seems to fail. Uh, Pallas is actually younger than Aeneas, whereas Patroclus is Achilles' mentor. Hmm. However, uh, young Pallas dies at the hand of Aeneas' archenemy and Patroclus dies at the hands of Achilles' archenemy. Okay, uh, Turnus will vaunt over the dying body of Pallas, and Hector will vaunt over the dying body of Patroclus. Uh, lastly, both characters, Aeneas and Achilles, will get their Aristia because they go on crazy killing sprees as a vengeance for the death of their good friends. So while there are differences in this comparison, that is, uh, Pallas is not the mentor of Aeneas, uh, like Patroclus was for Achilles. I think the tension is useful. I think that uh, Virgil didn't want these two things to be exactly the same. However, you're supposed to notice this relationship as you read along in the epic, and it enhances your reading of the epic, because it does refer back to the Iliad. Now I'd like to move on to a couple of key concepts that show up in these books. Uh, the first is that of Pietas. We've seen this. We saw this uh, when Aeneas left the city of Troy with his father on his back. His father was holding the gods of the Trojans, and he had his little son Ascanius's hand in his and was guiding them out of the burning city of Troy. That's an example of Pietas. We see it on display again in Book 10. After Aeneas is greeted by the ships, um, that have been turned into sea nymphs, he prays to the gods. The first thing he thinks to do is pray to the gods. Just as when he was given help in Book 8 by the river Tiber, the first thing he thought to do was make a sacrifice and thank the gods, especially Juno, his arch nemesis. So he is a man who is distinguished for his sense of duty to his gods, his family, and his country. And he'll show this time and again. The second concept I want to talk about in this book is one we haven't talked about before, and that is uh, furor, furor, which is a Latin word that means violent madness, rage, or bloodlust. And we see this on display very clearly in Book 10. After Turnus kills Pallas in the Battle of Aeneas gives no mercy to those who ask for it in battle. Uh, he mocks them as they're dying. He kills them as they're begging for mercy just like Achilles did when he went back into battle in the Iliad following the death of Patroclus. So, again, we not only have another parallel intertextuality to what was going on in the Iliad, uh, we have Aeneas displaying a new characteristic, a new character trait for him. Aeneas up to this point hasn't actually been all that violent of a guy, but here he really gets tough and he's harsh with his enemies. Now let's talk about Book 11 and the Aristia of Camilla. We first met Camilla in Book 7 when we learned about the Italian troops and their converging on the camp of Aeneas and his men in Hesperia. And here we first learned that there was a female warrior that had entered the narrative. So like Dido in Book 4, she is a woman who is a leader of her people uh, unlike Dido, she is actually a warrior, and she has no interest in marriage or men. She only has interest in fighting, as she is a devotee of Diana. Uh, you also know her as Artemis, sister of Apollo. And I would say the character of Camilla bears a very strong resemblance to a much earlier character uh, from the Homeric period by the name of Penthesilea. Now, we don't actually have a record of Penthesilea in the Iliad. Uh, she's a character who came a little later than that. But we first see reference to her uh, in authors like Diodorus of Sicily and Proclus, who were authors who were writing about uh, the ancient epic tradition. Virgil mentions her in Book 1 of the Aeneid when Aeneas approaches the temple of Juno at Carthage, and he sees the following image. 
and he sees an image of furious Penthesilea leading a battle line of Amazons with crescent shields as she glows in the middle of thousands fastening golden belts around the exposed breast. Female warrior, the maiden dares to run with men. Uh, who's Penthesilea? She is a queen of the Amazons and a daughter of Ares. And in return for Priam's help, she, along with all of her Amazons, entered the Trojan War on the side of the Trojans in the last year of the Trojan War after the death of Hector. So she wouldn't have appeared for us in the Iliad, but she's a character in the Trojan War that Virgil believed the audience would have remembered from earlier epics that we just don't have now. So, with that in mind, Virgil gives to us the character of Camilla. And Camilla's story is an interesting one. She's uh, the daughter of a deposed king. And when she was a baby, her father carried her out into the woods, escaping the revolt of his own people. And he, there he raised her to be a devotee of Diana. And as soon as she could stand, he gave her weapons so she could learn the arts of war. And she grew up big and strong. In Book 11, Virgil sets out to give her oh, a solid half of an entire book of this epic. And it's devoted to her Aristia. And when we look at the amount of lines she gets devoted to her killing, she actually seems to get more lines than a character like Pallas, and nearly as many as Aeneas. Why is this? Um, is she wholly an invention of Virgil's? Did Virgil just like the idea of having powerful women in his poem? Does she refer to something else? Clearly, there's a reference to Penthesilea here. Uh, she's not a throwaway. There's no reason why Virgil would have devoted a significant proportion of this poem to her if she were just that. It's my thought that is Virgil wants to tell the story of the Italian soldiers who fought in this conflict just as much as he wanted to tell that of the Trojans. After all, he is an Italian living in Rome as he's writing this epic. Perhaps he wanted to personify the warriors who lived in Italy, and as Italy was his mother, perhaps he wanted to give them a feminine kind of feel here. So we get Camilla. Join me for my next lecture on Book 12, and why it ends in such a strange way.